Thank you very much, Howard. And I want to thank the Allen Lamb House and Wichita State University and the Ulrich Museum for having me here and giving me the opportunity to talk to you about what I experienced and what I know of Frank Lloyd Wright and to share with you uh, also some of the work of my father, Lloyd Wright, who was a very great architect in his own way and uh, some of my work as well. And also to talk about the Allen Lamb House a little bit, a little mention of it, and a few slides, and also to talk about nature, which was the basis of my grandfather's philosophy and created what we call organic architecture. So with that, this of course is a photo of a galaxy, which is made up, actually the universe is made up of billions of galaxies and each galaxy has billions of stars and our sun is one of those stars and we're all created from stardust. We all are of the same basic material which forms the Earth, this gorgeous blue planet, unique, unique in our sphere and in our knowledge. And it is made up of weather patterns and shapes and forms. And here, one of the forms, of course, is this is a hurricane and the form is a spiral. A spiral is a basic form of nature. And you find it running through all the different cultures also uh, of humankind. The spiral always enters in as a very important symbol. And of course, this is air and water, important elements of nature. And we have also um, the tectonic plates forcing up the earth, this magnum which becomes earth and on which all things begin to grow and forms the green nature around our existence. This is a snowflake, which again is made up of, again, basic geometric forms of nature. This is a hexagon and it's formed by, there are six points on it and it's formed by three, actually by six, 30, 60 degree angle triangles and you put those six together and you get a snowflake. And the interesting thing about the snowflake is that of the trillions of snowflakes that fall every year onto the earth, no two are ever alike. Another form of the hexagon is the beehive and it's one of the basic forms and it is the best shape as a container. It can fit the best way in the least space. So nature has a way of taking these geometric forms and utilizing them. And Frank Lloyd Wright looked at these forms of nature and he said, the bees have this as one of their basic forms. And so he made what he called the hexagon house. And in working with that and just prior to it, he found that the 30, 60 degree triangle had a very important relationship to creating floor plans because the movement of the partitions were always away from you. They didn't come in at 90 degrees, but they moved away at 120 degrees. So they opened up the space and they made the room feel more spacious. And so he, from that experience, he created what he called the 30, 60 degree unit system and the, which in turn went in and became the hexagonal unit system. And what we're looking at here is the Hanna House, uh, which is at Stanford, California, Stanford University. 
and uh, all of the walls are laid out on this hexagonal system. And he called the house the honeycomb house. Another part of nature that's very important is fractals. Many small elements that make up the whole. And each one of those small elements in its own way represents the whole. And here we have the stained glass window from the Darwin D. Martin house in Buffalo. And uh, we call it the tree of life. And it's an abstraction made of stained glass and lead canes. And there are, in this one window, then there are 27 windows in the house, there are 17,000 pieces that make up one window. But they're fractals. They represent fractals, small pieces that make up the whole, that make up the design. And Frank Lloyd Wright used that in his architecture to make up his whole building. All those windows and all the furniture were essential fractors to creating the space that he desired to make. Another building, the Ennis House, in Los Angeles, California, is made up of concrete blocks. Here again, each concrete block has a, a singular pattern in it and is repeated. There are 10,000 blocks in the house, and that re pattern repeats through all of them. And each block represents the house in itself. It has the same characteristics and the same idea behind it to create it. And each one of those blocks is unique in its way, but when you put them all together, it creates the house. These are some of the influences on my grandfather, and these 10 individuals here were his mother, who is in the center holding the Bible, Anna Lloyd-Jones, and these are the Lloyd-Joneses in Spring Green, Wisconsin. And um, it's from them that he got his basic concept of working with nature, of being part of nature. They were Welsh, they were Celtic, and uh, most of them had been born in Wales and migrated here to the United States, immigrated. And um, they were a strong family. And they actually created their own chapel called Unity Chapel, which is on the grounds now of Taliesin in Wisconsin. And this was uh, built in 1886. And they built this chapel because the patriarch of the family, Richard Lloyd Jones, was a minister. As he was a hat maker, basically, but also a minister. And he did not get along with the local church. And they had a falling out, so he said, well, I'll create my own church. So the family built this chapel. And they were really very much in the Unitarian mold of thinking, universal. This is a board which is the Froebel block system. And Froebel was a German educator in the 1820s, 1830s. He developed the concept of working with a unit system. You can see a square board with units on it. And he made these little triangular blocks uh, which could be put together to make various geometric shapes. And he had these for training children how to work and abstract with nature. And they could develop their own forms with it. And uh, they also worked with paper, cut paper. And here are some of the cut paper designs. And you can see that this is very much like a Mondrian design. And uh, this was made by a child. She was eight years old. And uh, 
the idea was again to get to the essence of design of nature and the Froebel system not only worked with uh, these paper strips but you also had origami they did origami figures with paper uh, they did stick structures with peas and thin bars of wood and uh, they had these they also did cut paper and it turns out that the artists and Mondrian was one of them was trained in the Froebel system and it was for children from the ages of four until eight and it was what Froebel called the kindergarten and actually it was brought over here to this country in the 1860s it formed all our kindergartens and actually was very well taught all the way up through the 20s and 30s and then eventually fell out of use in our kindergarten system but Frank Lloyd Wright was chained in it his mother had seen these at the Philadelphia Exposition and had seen some uh, demonstrations of it and she said that's what she wanted for her son and so she brought home the material and tools and actually got training over here in this country so that she could train her son Frank whom she wanted to be an architect the Froebel system of kindergarten and my grandfather credits that with being the one of the major influences on his work and his creativity and you can see from that board that was there that Froebel had with the squares on it where Frank Lloyd Wright got the idea for his unit system first starting with squares and then 30 60 degree parallelograms and then going to hexagons and later on in, in his life the unit system became circles this is Blake the great philosopher painter poet uh, my grandfather was a great admirer of him and he said that to have great architecture you first have to have great architects and to him a great architect was one who was well educated who was steeped in philosophy in poetry in music and so to him uh, Blake was important Thoreau Whitman Emerson these were all very important influential people in his development and uh, for his reading material I was an apprentice of his and worked with him for eight years and one of the basic reading materials you had to do was the poetry of Whitman and you had to read Thoreau's Walden Pond and also Emerson's essay on nature and that love of Emerson and Whitman and Thoreau came through his parents and his Welch ancestors his uncles and aunts who were poets they were really um, farmers and educators and ministers this is the great wave of Hokusai a Japanese print he loved Japanese prints and he loved the Japanese culture it was very important with him, for him because he felt that the Japanese culture was very much in tune with nature and understood nature and worked with nature and here you see in the great wave the immensity of the wave and the smallness of the human beings nature is dominant it's interesting too to see the curves of the waves and the curves of the boats and the curves of Mount Fuji they're all related to each other and he loved the Japanese prints because they were flat two-dimensional they were made with ink on rice paper so that medium was two-dimensional and so the art was two-dimensional it was of the nature of the medium the wave itself you can see in all those 
little curls of the foam, each one of them is the same shape as the, the overall wave. And each one of them adds to the total effect of creating the wave. Again, we're talking about fractals. This is the Wainwright Building in Buffalo, New York. And it was designed by Adler and Sullivan. And Louis Sullivan was the great architect whom my grandfather called the Liebermeister, his main mentor. He worked with him for seven years as his chief draftsman. Another influence was Native American. He always admired the Native Americans, the Pueblo Indians and the Plains Indians, the teepees. He thought the teepee was uh, a wonderful structure. And uh, of course, it was probably our first mobile RV home type thing. It could be moved around on horseback and set up again. Mobile home. And of course it was a circular form which my grandfather felt was always very important. Circular space. So we look at some buildings of Frank Lloyd Wright. This was one of his earliest. It's his own home in Oak Park. 19, uh, no, actually 1890. And it was shingle style. The first architect he worked for when he went to Chicago when he was 19 was Silsby. And Silsby was the great shingle architect of the Midwest. And so it was natural for, for, for Frank Lloyd Wright, even though at this point he was working for Sullivan, that the style was in the shingle form. But here there are a few things that are actually a little more than the shingle style. And that upper large triangle overhangs the lower floor by a foot or two, which is usually the uh, shingle style that was flush with the lower floor and went right down. And then by 1903, quite a change from 1890 to 1903, we have the Gale residence and uh, when the European architects, young architects, saw this, it was published in the Wasmuth Portfolio in 1910 in Germany. And it was a series of 67 lithographs of his houses, most of them, uh, of course, all in the prairie style. But when they saw this, this had a great effect upon them. And especially on the architect Walter Gropius, uh, who formed the Bauhaus, and upon Mies van der Rohe. They were all students at the university at the time that this publication came out. But you'll see this work in their buildings. And you notice how the window line up above is all a solid line of windows. There are no plastered sections in between. What they did with the standard house, and they still do today, is to punch holes in it. But here, though, they're not punching holes. Here, it is a whole fascia, a whole wall section, which is of glass and windows and open. Unity Temple in Oak Park, 1904, one of the first reinforced concrete structures ever built in the United States. It has this magnificent interior space. The whole sanctuary is roof of the sanctuary is a skylight, which lets this wonderful light down from the top. And the audience sits on three sides, so it surrounds the minister. These were all new concepts in that time period, 1904. And now we get to the prairie school or prairie style. Of course, my grandfather didn't like the word style. He said, I, I'm not stylish. Uh, it doesn't last. The architecture I do does last. So this is a prairie, prairie form. And uh, this is the Martin House, uh, again in 1905 in Buffalo, New York. And this is the Roby House, 1909, 
in Oak Park. These two are marvelous examples of what we call the prairie style, the prairie school. And of course here is the Allen Lamb House right here in Wichita. It is considered one of the major prairie form houses of my grandfather, which some of you would be able to see today. And it's a beautifully done interior as well. This is the Porte Gauchere. This is looking down the street. And you see again here the bank of windows at the street level with a, uh, what we call a wainscot course of brick. And then the windows sitting on top of it. And the windows aren't punched into a brick wall or a plaster wall. They are set in as a bank of windows so that you had a continuous horizontal line and it let more light into the room and it accented the horizontality of the building and it gave it a uniformity of the total structure. This is the garden. Now this is a unique part of the Allen Lamb house. There are, this is very unique for a prairie style house and it's a, a beautiful garden with a pool. There again, looking at it from the south side. Looking towards the garage area and apartment. And you can see on the right the flower vases, the circular bowl-shaped flower vases on top of the wall. This is the living room, wonderful living room. Open, airy, light, and uh, up above the, uh, on the center of the ceiling are two are light fixtures running down, two of them running down the length of the living room. And this was a unique thing of Frank Lloyd Wright was putting in a flush light fixture. You, these houses very much, are very much influenced by the art and crafts movement where the Id concept was that you left the materials in their true nature. You didn't try to disguise them. You didn't paint them. You left them with a natural finish. You used them for what they could naturally be used for. You didn't distort them. Here are these patterns that you see above were cut into uh, pieces of wood with a jigsaw to make the pattern, and they were flush. Now, in most arts and crafts homes, the fixtures were hung separately. And um, here again is a flush fixture, which is unique. This is a stained glass fixture with lights behind it. Uh, this is unique to the Allen Lamb house. But here again, he was flushing the fixture instead of putting it on the surface of the wall. He made it part of the wall. There are these fixtures which are hung in the house. And this would have been a typical arts and crafts style of putting the fixture in. It would hung, hang down from the ceiling or hang out from the wall. Whereas as you saw just previously, the other fixtures were flush made to be part of the wall, not added to the wall. This is the dining room furniture, very simple, craftsman style, but it has its own unique Frank Lloyd Wright touch to it that it just makes it so much more beautiful. And But it's still on the same principles, simplicity and naturalness of the arts and crafts school. You can see in the background on the left side, in the middle, stained glass doors on the cabinet work. And there again, this is that what we call the fractals. The, the furniture is a fractal of the house. The art glass is a fractals and represents the character of the house. And you need all of that together to create the space. As Frank Lloyd Wright says, it's the inner space that is important. And you take any of those elements out, 
and you've decreased the quality of the space. Something is missing. This is the kitchen and uh, wonderful woodwork in the kitchen and uh, now we go to another house a little later. The Allen Lamb house was 1917, 1918 and this as most of you know is falling water and it's 1935 and very much different yet very much the same in its character. It's made of concrete and steel and rock. But here again, he's working with nature. He's carrying the rock right up, the same rock that's on the site and the rock outcroppings. He anchored the house into the rock outcroppings with rock walls and a rock chimney mass. And that all becomes an extension of the rocks that are on the base and on the ground. And the concrete walls are there for the cantilever for, to get the thrusting of the balconies out just as the rocks would thrust out from the sides or the branches from a tree would move out from the tra central trunk. And of course, the story with this is that the uh, owner when he saw the plans, he saw that the, there was a big rock right projecting out of the floor of the living room at, right at the fireplace. It was very low, uh, just a few inches above the floor, but it was quite large, several feet in diameter. And Mr. Kaufman turned to my grandfather and he said, Frank, he said, that's the rock I sit on and look at the waterfall. And you've covered it up. I won't see the waterfall. And my grandfather said, Edgar, you won't look at the waterfall. You will be the waterfall. And so that's what had, the wonderful thing about this house is that it is as much a part of the waterfall as the rocks and the trees around it. And you couldn't think of that site with anything else there but falling water. In 1936, he did the Johnson Wax Administration Building in Racine, Wisconsin, and uh, probably one of the most beautiful interior workspaces that we have anywhere. And uh, the main floor was where the workers are, and the mezzanine floor is where the management has their offices. The upper, the whole roof and ceiling is made up of these large columns and glass tubing. That's, that's the glass tubing lets the light come through. And um, a newspaper man, when they, reporter, when they first opened the building, went through and he said, it's like lying on the bottom of a lily pond and looking up at the lily pads. 1936, he did the Jacobs One House and what he called the Usonian House. It was to be the house for the average American citizen. This was built for $5,000 bonded bid building. And it had probably the country, I think, as far as I've been able to find, the first radiant heated floor. It was very simple, made of, it was basically wood structure and brick. And these bricks, to keep the cost down, the Jacobs went down to Racine and took all the um, rejected bricks on the Johnson Wax building to put in their house. So it really has two connections. Then there was the Jacobs II house. And in 1947, the Jacobs commissioned my grandfather do a house for them just outside of Madison, about 20 minutes outside in a town called Middleton. 
And um, so my grandfather created this house, which he called the Solar Hemicycle. And the lower circle of the house, the smaller uh, section of the house with glass doors that opens out, is facing the south. And the dark wall line uh, on the back of the house is in the north. And he had the north side with a berm, earth berm, going up against it to within two feet of the roof and had windows above the two feet so to let light into bedrooms. Bedrooms were on the second floor. And then the south would be two stories high. And here you can see it. On the left is the, the north side with the earth berm coming up towards the windows. And the windows are just below the roof line. So there wasn't very much glass or exposure on the north. It was protecting it from the north winds. And on the south to the right, you can see the two-story windows into the living room and into the bedroom mezzanine floor. And here's the interior. You can see there's a pool of water. The interior water was 16 inches deep and had water in it all year and water plants. The exterior pool was four feet deep. It was the continuation of the same circle. And they would empty the water out in the winter time, but in the summertime it became a cooling pool. And when you had hot summers, sticky, humid summers, they would take a dip in that outer pool. The inner pool always acted in wintertime as a thermal sump. And so it would absorb the heat during the daytime when the sun came in. And that was the same with the concrete floor and the block and the concrete, uh, concrete floor and the stonework. They would absorb the heat in the daytime and then they would let that heat out in the evening. So it was what we call passive solar. Worked very effectively in the wintertime. In the summertime, you opened up the windows to get the breeze going through. This is the Johnson Wax Tower, which is attached to the Johnson Wax Administration Building. And here you can see with the sun coming through it, it uh, had the exterior was brick and glass tubing, but the floors were all cantilevered from a central uh, mass that had the elevator and, and the utilities in it. And the, uh, then there was a, always a mezzanine floor above each main floor. And this is the Price Building, which is built on the same concept. There's a central shaft, and, uh, and rather than being a square unit system, in this particular case, it was a 30, 60 degree unit system. But it was still the same principle. The main floors were cantilevered off of this same shaft, and there was a mezzanine floor in between. And it was a combination of apartment building and office building. And the apartment buildings had adjustable louvers that ran vertically, and they faced the southeast and the southwest. And you could control the louvers to let the sun in or out, depending on what you needed. On the north, they were fixed horizontal louvers because you never had the sun shining in on the north side of the building. So it showed that Frank Lloyd Wright was extremely aware of climate, of weather, of passive solar design, of what we call green architecture. In his way, and he was still far advanced from what was other architects were doing at that time. This is the Unitarian Church in Madison, Wisconsin. Copper roof on it. This is the interior, the wonderful sloping ceiling. This is the Monona Terrace in Madison, Wisconsin. And um, my grandfather first started this design in 1937. And um, unfortunately, they, didn't, they couldn't get the money together to build it. 
And then they tried again in 1956, and uh, it was put up as a bond issue, and it was passed by the people of Madison, but the mayor of Madison didn't like my grandfather, so he, he wouldn't allow it to be built. And it was tried again in 1963, 19, yeah, 1963 and uh, they put up a bond issue it had, by that time, originally had been designed as a concert hall and um, also had um, conference rooms. By the time when they got to, well, even in 1963, it was still a conference hall, but, uh, and uh, 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 a place for the uh, Madison Symphony. But at this time, it was voted down by the electorate. Then in 1982, 83, they revived it again because they needed to get a convention center, and they thought this would be perfect. It overlooked Lake Monona, and it had a straight path up to the Capitol building, <clears throat> and it provided, the top deck provided an acre of in a sense, parkland, where they could have festivities and different things, and the public could walk up there and look out over Monona Lake. So I thought it would be ideal for a uh, convention center. And so, by God, it was pulled out and went for a vote to the public, and they voted for it. So it was built in 82 or 83, I'm not sure of the date. But that's quite a span, from 1937 to 1983. If you wait long enough, <laughs> it, this building, by the way, has become the icon for Madison, Wisconsin. This is the interior, one of the interior of the hallways. And this is some work of my father, Lloyd Wright, a great architect in his way, not as well recognized. In fact, not as recognized as he should be. One of his great buildings is the Wayfarer's Chapel in Palos Verdes, California, sometimes referred to as the Glass Chapel. And his idea was that he would make this of glass and plant redwood and pine trees on the side, and they would cover it, and they would be the covering, uh, the true covering for the building, and the glass was just to protect you from the weather. This is the interior. This is actually much more grown up now than from when this slide was made quite a while ago. The trees are much taller and you do feel that you're in a grove of redwoods and pines. Again, here we're worshiping with as much nature as possible. My father also designed the first Hollywood Bowl in 1928. It was unfortunately torn down in 1929 because the original bowl was made of wood and plywood panels. It cost originally $25,000 to build. And <clears throat> the Hollywood Bowl Association, in their infinite wisdom, it was meant to be taken down every year in the wintertime because the plywood, of course, wasn't waterproof and couldn't take the weather. And then reassembled in the summer and it cost four hundred dollars to do it and the Hollywood Bowl Association decided they didn't want to pay the four hundred dollars so they left it out for, and then by the second year the plywood began warping away and then of course politics came into play and a group called the Allied Architects said we can build a bowl for you that'll stand forever and so they went and they made theirs out of a steel structure with transite panels and when they, and then instead of this low ellipse that you see, which directed the sound right down over the audience into the audience, they made a full half circle, which made it much higher, and the sound went up and over the head of the audience, and they couldn't hear. It, the original bowl was set for 18,000 people, so what they had to do is they had to bring in amplification. This bowl with the wood shell was not amplified. This is the Soden residence in 1926 in Hollywood, California. And uh, 
Gill, uh, a reporter on the New Yorker magazine who wrote a book on my autobiography or a biography of my grandfather, Brendan Gill. Uh, he wrote an article on this house once and he called it uh, the house Jaws. It does have. <laughs> But uh, the lower part is the entrance, and the upper part where you have the glass is actually the living room looking out onto a street. But most of it was closed off from that street because it was quite a busy street. And this was the interior back court that had an interior courtyard. And these were all made of concrete blocks. Again, the fractal system. This is my father's own home house and studio in West Hollywood, California, again made with concrete blocks and a wood frame stucco, which was different than my grandfather. My grandfather's concrete block houses were all concrete block. There was no introduction of wood and plaster. But my father did that because of the cost. It turned out the cost for those all block houses was very expensive. This is the Taggart residence in Hollywood, California, made of lap redwood boards. This is the living room. And this is one of the later houses of my father in 1968, the Bowler House in Palos Verdes, California, called the Bird of Paradise House. And that front window is 24 feet high of mitered glass. This is the interior, a walnut abstract panel made of plastic ins colored plast glass inserts and uh, aluminum, gold anodized aluminum. And the furniture was designed by my father. This is some of my work, a uh, house I did for my brother in Hollywood, California, and uh, it was 1,200 square feet. He was a teacher, so it had to be affordable, and this was built in 1961, and we built the house for $22,000, including the swimming pool, and it uh, is about 1,200 square, 12, 1,400 square feet. This is the living room, and my brother uh, and his wife had no children. They liked to entertain, and uh, the room to the right is the master bedroom. And my brother said, well, why, why don't we open that? And I said, that, well, if, if you're willing to make the bed all the time, we can open it up to the living room. So we put this partition up, folding partition. You can see it sagged. A uh, roller broke on it, and we can't open it, and it never, my brother never opened it. He just left it that way. And, and it didn't break until he'd been, it was 20 years old, and then after that he just left it. He said, I don't need it. <laughs> and this is uh, Weiss Track House in La, Cre La Crescenta, California, using a circular roof. And this is the entry area, which is a concrete vault with a skylight that looks up towards the Sierra Madre Mountains. The house I did for Fred Newman in Malibu, California, using a curved roof and curved sides. It has a rectangular unit system, but I used curved or, uh, uh, corners on it. and curved sections on the roof. And the roof has an inch and a half of lightweight concrete poured over a standard build-up roofing, and uh, the soffits are all stucco as well as the walls are concrete block and stucco. And that's done to protect it from fire because we have lots of fires in Malibu, brush fires. And uh, this house, knock on wood, has not been affected, although two fires have gone by it. This is the interior, the living room, just as it was completed before it was furnished. Skylight above the fireplace, circular living room. 
This is a house for Maria Newman, also in Malibu. And uh, the roof is a uh, copper roof with clear story roofs above the living room and entry. And here you see those clear story roofs going up towards the chimney. And that's to help get light into the upper section of the house as well as affect the sound. It takes out the reverberation by having these different levels. And the fireplace is made of uh, river rock from a local creek right near the house. This is my own house, in, also in Malibu. And uh, the hilltop, the hill actually rises behind it. And the railing that you see going around the, both the upper deck, which is the roof, and the lower deck, which is the bedroom deck over the living room and dining area, those, that railing is actually solar panels, or to be solar panels. They have not been built yet. The house is all concrete. Again, fire situation. And the roofs are all um, green roofs. They have sod roofs. That's looking in towards the living room. And uh, fireplace on the right serves both the living room and the dining area. And this is looking from the top of the hill down onto the top of the house, which becomes part of the hill. And those wood or posts are temporary. They'd be replaced with the solar panels. An important part of my grandfather's work and life is his work with the, what he called the Taliesin Fellowship, training young architects. As I said before, he said to have great architecture, you need great architects. And so, we all lived and worked in Taliesin and Hillside. This is the living room at Taliesin. And this is Romeo and Juliet, windmill designed by my grandfather for his aunts. By the way, the windmill, an interesting fact on the windmill was that uh, when he designed it, his uncles, when the aunts showed it to him, said, well, that's stupid. That thing's going to blow down. They went ahead. They loved Frank Lloyd Wright. They loved their nephew, and they were going to build that windmill, regardless of what their brothers said. So they put the windmill up, and after every major storm that went through, the uncles would come out on their porch to see if the building was still standing. Well, the building is still standing, but the uncles aren't. <laughs> and this is the Hillside Home School. Uh, by the way, that Hillside Home School is now part of the Taliesin Fellowship of the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation. And uh, it has the dining rooms, the conference room, and the theater. And this is a photograph of the theater. Gorgeous curtain. Again, all, all the work, everything you see here, the seats, everything, the building itself, it's all built by the Taliesin Fellowship. That Actually, I should say rebuilt, because the original building was part of the 1903 Ants building, and it was burned down in 1954 and rebuilt by the Fellowship into a theater. This is the desert camp, we called it. Uh, it's Taliesin West in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. And they didn't have a lot of money. And my, but my grandfather saw these stones that were all sitting around on the floor of the desert. And if you turned them over, they were red on the underside where they're against the earth, and they were black on the upper side where they were exposed to the sun. So he put these into the concrete formwork and called it desert masonry. And there's a view, overall view. On the left side is the drafting room, canvas roof. And then up above the window line, horizontal window line up above is the guest quarters. And then to the far right is the living room. And this is the living room, the interior. And all the apprentices lived out in tents. We were given a nine by nine sheep herders tent 
and that became our space and we could do whatever we want. Here they added a base to it and a concrete floor. Here they didn't even use the tent. The apprentice made a whole new roof, whole new form. And most of the apprentices preferred living out in the desert in these tents because it gave you a not only having your own space, but it gave you an opportunity to do some of your own design work. Here they are working on the theater. As I said, all of Taliesin West was built by the apprentices. We did our own cabinet work, did our own cooking, had our own garden. We'd get up every morning, and at 7 o'clock, we would have chorus, and at 8 o'clock, we would go out and work in the garden. At 9 o'clock, then we would go back to our different jobs, whether it was drafting or construction or what, until 3, uh, actually until 4. There's the drafting room. This was built by the apprentices, and it was added to the Hillside Home School in 1934. This is Ling Po, one of the top architects in association with my grandfather. And he taught rendering, how to do architectural rendering as well to the students. We did dance, created our own dance and costumes, music. We had ensemble, practiced every afternoon after lunch. We had chorus, practiced every morning from seven until eight. It was a total environment, a total way of life that was so important to my grandfather to create a way of life in which you worked and lived that was based on beauty and based on working with nature. It's, of course, a seashell. And I come back to this to show you a basic form of nature, the spiral. <clears throat> and like a great oak tree that starts with an acorn, that interior space grows out to become a full oak tree. It's the same here. It starts in the very middle with a small animal who starts working away, excreting the calcium that forms the shell and keeps working and working until you have this whole she outer shell, but it all started from the interior, from a central idea. And that's the same with the Guggenheim Museum. It started from the interior and worked out. You started with an idea, a small kernel idea, and that you began wor working with it, and it developed this spiral that got, went ever wider as it went up. So you kept expanding as you went up the ramp. And then you had, when you got to the top, there was a glass skylight letting the spheres of above, the whole atmosphere of the outside come in from the... And so you went up this ramp emotionally, spiritually, and out through the top. And this is where you get also, one of the things that I know people objected to was that it wasn't a place that you could hang large modern art, yet I've been in there when they've had some large pieces, and you can stand on one side of the, of the ramp and look across the space to the painting on the other side, and it gives you a whole new perspective. So there were many new concepts of viewing art that happened from this building. So what happens when you have that interior spiral, that's expressed on the exterior. And that you can see in this form, the ever widening spiral. And my grandfather always said, this I think is probably the, the best example of what he said organic architecture was about. He said, organic architecture is that the space within the building will shape the exterior of the building. And that was certainly true of the Guggenheim Museum. It's, this is really the culmination of 
Frank Lloyd Wright's work. Well, I've covered and ended with what I feel is the most important, and uh, I hope it's been some information that I've been able to give you about my grandfather and about his always quest through his whole life to integrate life, art, work with itself and with the human being so that we develop a society that honors nature, understands nature, works with nature. And a society, I think I could paraphrase my grandfather as saying that to have a great society, you have to have great citizens. And that's what he was striving for all his life, and that's what his architecture was meant to achieve. Thank you. <laughs>